you know, in some states, you don't have to tell them you're recording them. In some states, you do. Do you know whether Florida is a notification of recording state or not? It's a so-called two-party state. We are a two-party state, which means that if you record something, you have to alert the other party that you are recording it. Not every state's like that. New York is a one-party state. You can secretly record your conversations and not tell the other party. Education, though, I think you can do just about anything because nobody really cares. But I am happy the voice announces it. Make sure that we all know it's being recorded. So for all the people who didn't know, we're doing number five, where the mom is four times the size of the daughter, but they have the same kinetic energy. So kinetic energy of mom is one half m v for mom squared and kinetic energy for the daughter is one half mass of daughter velocity of daughter squared and these are equal so as soon as we make them equal and they want the ratio of the of the velocities so what we're going to do is we're going to just do this substitution which allows us to cancel out one of the masses and leaves us with the two velocities so the moment i I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna get rid of this in the way and just say that these two things are equal. And once I do my substitution, I get one half times four mass of daughter, velocity of mom squared equals one half mass of daughter, velocity of daughter squared. And I can cancel out the one halves and I can cancel out the mass of the daughters and I'm left with four equals velocity of daughter squared to velocity of mom squared. And I'm gonna take the square root of both sides, which gives me that the ratio of their velocities is two to one. So I think the answer is two. Okay, right, next question. Not at the level of your actual exam, this is just, this is just practice. Uh, number six, please. So a number four and a number six. Oh, 14 and six. Okay, so we'll do six first. So number six. Oh, let me see. There are a lot of parts here. Oh, the graph? All right. Yes. This has got to be Xander. Indeed. Whenever there's a graph, Xander needs to ask a question about it. It's okay. It's okay. That has gotten to be quite the annoying thing. Has that been as annoying in every class as it feels like it's annoying in this one? Last period was bad. I, I'm not sure we learned anything in E and M. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my mind around whatever I was doing, because every few seconds that just. Phew. What cracks me up is that. I mean, your teacher, I don't know, who's your teacher last class period? Was he just flipping out after a while? Oh, yeah. All right. I mean, everybody had a teacher last class period. Were all of your teachers kind of flipping out about it or just like, whatever? Because I, I know that I'm flipping out about it. Mr. Bright learned to put up with it, but my theater teacher was mad. It's amazing how tolerant Mr. Bright is. He's quite tolerant. All right, so basically, it says I have this 1.1 kilogram particle moving along an X axis experiences the force shown in the figure. The particle's velocity is 4.2 meters per second at time zero. Oh no, at position zero. And it says, what is the velocity when it makes it to two meters? Well, you know, whenever you're given a graph, you're supposed to analyze the slope in the area. If I analyze the slope, I get a ratio of force to position and that doesn't mean anything to me. So I don't think it has any meaning. But when I analyze the area, I get, you know, force times position or force times displacement. That's got to be the work done on the particle. So the area under these two sides has got to be the, the work done, which is going to be the change in kinetic energy of the particle, if this is the only work being done. So I'm going to set whatever's in here equal to the change in kinetic energy of the particle. So it's one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared. Okay. This is new. Papa John's pizza. Yeah. 
Yep, it's been there for a year. I'm just telling you, it's been, it's been there for a year. That's nice. Thank you. All right. <sighs> Somebody might be coming to install the projector. Now, what's hilarious is that phone call was, has the backboard been installed yet? Yeah, for about a year. <sighs> what cracks me up is, I don't know if you, you, you're not as close to the backboard as I am, but it's a piece of crappy plywood with four screws in it into a cement block wall. They say they can't install the projector in that wall because it's not a bearing wall, but I've drilled into it. It is a cement block wall. I'll be honest. If I was going to have to install something that's about 20 pounds, I'd probably rather use cement block anchors than anchors that are going to go into a piece of plywood that's affixed to the cement block wall. But this is the way the district does it. Of course, we're getting to hear the bell and intercom system the way the district does it too. So I expect that thing to fall and hit me in the head. I'm expecting probably before Christmas, but you know, there's, who knows? But just so you guys know, the whole projector installation thing has been well, I've gotten in trouble because of my thoughts about it a couple of times, because I've, I've asked the question, do you know when they're going to install it? And I've gotten in trouble for asking. I'm working on it is the, the, so I stopped asking just to, and just to put it in perspective, I put in a request to install it in November of 2019. So I guess I've been, I guess I'm just impatient wanting it to be installed in less than a year as it sits in the box in the stock room. <laughs> so, and with all the other things that got stolen out of this classroom, I really expected that the projector was going to be gone, but it's still there. It's still there. So um, Xander, I don't have to do any more of this problem. I think I get the point. Uh, I mean, just... they give you the mass and they give you how fast it's going. So. Uh, this is one and a half times 1.1 times 2.4 squared. Uh, this is one half MV final squared. And the area inside there looks to be one half times 10 times two. So um, I'm pretty sure that's just going to be equal to 10 because that's a change in kinetic energy. Yeah, I got it from there. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. Next, 14, yay, 14. I'm so excited to do number 14. Starting from rest, a crate of mass M is pushed up a frictionless slope of angle theta by a horizontal force of magnitude F. Use work and energy to find an expression for the crate's speed when it's at the height H above the bottom of the slope. Okay, if we must, but you know, they want the velocity it says. So my assumption is that they want this done by doing work. Um, I can think of about a, at least two other ways we could probably do this problem. So let's, let's be aware of your, your possibilities here. And I hope you're starting to see that there are more than one way we can do problems. For example, we could, using this, using net force, we could find the acceleration of the system and then use a motion equation to figure out the velocity. Perfectly adequate. They want you to use a specific method, but you don't, and, and on the exam, you can use whatever method you want unless they specify, and they're very unlikely to specify. So that's one way to solve it. Um, we could use the work energy theorem. That is perfectly acceptable. And that's what we're going to use right here. But we're also going to do it a second time. And the second time we do it, we're going to use um, conservation of energy.
because all three of these will be successful. All right, so let's consider the work energy theorem as the first one. They, they want this to be in terms of the height, not the length of the ramp. So we are going to have to probably come up with some conve convections, not convections, some conventions for this. So give me just a second. So I'm a little distracted by that phone call and I think you all can probably imagine why. Of course, I think it's just getting my hopes up because the guy who called to say if he can install it has been here already once before, I assume, because he came out to install it and the backboard wasn't installed and so didn't. And then a different guy came out to say, I can't do it because the electrical hasn't been run. Now, you'll notice the electrical still hasn't been run. It's been paid for. I can't run the electrical because apparently I don't know how to run a extension cord. So um, I bet the guy's gonna come out to install it and say that, well, it can't be done until the electrical is done. Cause I don't think that was the electrical guy. So just, just saying, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling frustrated that I'm gonna be mad, but here we go. This is H, this, what do you wanna call that? L, great. Um, we're applying the force horizontally, it says, like so, and the angle here is theta. So what we have to recognize is that we're supposed to do everything in terms of H, but the work done by the force, just looking at it is gonna be um, F times L times cosine theta. Because by definition, that's how you calculate work. It's the size of the force times the displacement times the angle between the force and the displacement. Um, at the same time, there's gonna be work done by gravity. Gravity is downwards. And that's gonna be, well, mg times h times the cosine of 180 degrees, because it goes upwards, but gravity's acting downwards. The only force I don't have to worry about is the normal force. The normal force doesn't do any work because the work done by the normal force, and I'm including it because there are examples where the normal force could do work. It just, just this isn't one of them. The work done by the normal force is gonna be whatever the normal force is times L times the cosine of 90 degrees. So it doesn't do any work, but I'm considering the work done by all three of the forces because these are the three forces that act in the system. And so I'm just trying to make sure I've, I've covered them all. It, you guys as students, be aware that if there's a force acting in the system, challenge the problem to see if that force does work. That's something that people on AP writing tests tend to try and do to see if you're paying attention to all the forces that are there. So you might not have thought to check the normal force here as a force that could do work, but it could have done work. In fact, there's a way in which it could do work even in this example, if we happen to choose a different scenario for how we apply these the, the um, displacements. On the other hand, we do have an issue. We have the fact that Oh, wait, I made a mistake. Well, no, I know that. Um, I really should write this as L cosine of um, 90 plus theta. I'm sorry to do it that way. I know it's gonna end up being MGH in the, at the end, but we did everything else in terms of going up the ramp. So I have to do this one in terms of going up the ramp too. Sorry. You guys understand what I'm saying? Okay, so we've got all of our pieces. Let's actually put this together now. Um, uh, this is kind of a mess, but 
I think we need to put L in terms of H. That's what you brought up. So let's go ahead and do that now. Um, H is the opposite side of a triangle related to theta. So sine theta equals H over L. So I could write L as H over sine theta. That's one way I could do it. Is, is that okay? Replace all of the L's with H over sine theta. I'm allowed to have theta in my answer. So let's do that. And I'm gonna go to another page here because this is kind of a mess or just make this smaller. Let's just make this smaller. So here we go. We have F H over sine theta times cosine theta plus M G H over sine theta. And here's where I've got, a, I've got an issue. Cosine of 90 plus theta. Do you guys know this, that it's minus sine theta? I don't know if you guys know that or not. Do you? You could figure that out, but it has to be true. And you should look at why it's true. We know it's gonna be negative because it's gonna force the angle into the second quadrant because you're adding 90 to it. And if you look at where it is, it ends up just being the sine. But yes, that's true. So in this case, the cosine of 90 plus theta is gonna be minus sine theta. And this has to equal the change in kinetic energy of the block. Now, if you're worried about this, don't be. And I'll show you why in a minute, but don't be worried about that. But be worried about this. Um, this is gonna be F H cotangent theta minus M G H equals one half M V squared. All righty. Now you just have to solve for V. That's not particularly interesting. You're just gonna like, you know, multiply by two, divide by M, take the square root. If you didn't come up with this, do you realize in class, we talked about the fact that the force down the ramp is MG sine theta anyways. So you likely would have just put MG sine theta and times, you know, H over sine theta times cosine of 180 degrees for it being in the opposite direction. But the signs had to cancel out. And the reason they had to cancel out is simple. The box started at the baseline and at the end, it was up here. So we know it has gravitational potential energy at the top of the ramp. If we look at this, this is a statement of conservation of energy. It doesn't look like it, but it is. Consider that in this example, in this whatever it is, this represents what you did on the system. You gave the system energy by applying a force to it. So you put this into the system. As a result, the box has gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. The energy before equals the energy after. You gave the box this much energy, it was spread out over the gravitational potential energy the box has at the top of the ramp and the kinetic energy the box has at the top of the ramp. So it's, it's just a straight, it's a straight application of conservation of energy. But the energy you give to the system has to equal the energy the system has. No, we don't have to. We, we did not have to do it this way. The problem is forcing us to do it this way because they want it in terms of H. But we could have done this actually choosing any direction we want to be our displacement. So we did it this way because the box actually went up the ramp, the length L. So that's why 
I chose to do it this way because that's where the problem laid it out in the book. But we could have done this problem completely different and maybe not have had, we're, we're gonna have this funky cotangent no matter what we do because we want it in terms of H and they gave us this force that was horizontal. So no matter what we're doing, we're, getting, we're gonna have some weird geometry. This is an unusual thing. This doesn't show up on the exam, but you know, to have this weird geometry stuff, they're gonna be more direct, but this problem, because they had to push the box sideways to get it to go up, does give us this kind of weird cotangent. So yeah, I chose to make the length of the ramp the displacement. Believe it or not, we could have done this whole thing with the box going straight up at H and made H our displacement. And if you want, we can do the problem again using H as our displacement the whole time. It's up to you. Hmm? Yeah, instead of making it go up the ramp the way we drew it here, we can talk about just applying a force and only looking at the displacement as it would be going up. Well, when I went straight up, yeah. well, you're not going to like the answer to this. If I look at just going straight up, um, in my displace, if I make it so my displacement is from here to here, and not look at the sideways displacement at all, then this force doesn't do any work, but the normal force does but I can't express in terms of the normal force. So I end up having to find through Newton's laws, the size of the normal force in terms of the horizontal force. So it's not fun. I don't want to do it that way, but you could do it that way. But yes, I don't know who said it back there, but the answer is don't do it that way. The answer is to do it this way. That way the normal force cancels away. So why did I assign this problem? I don't know, I'm a jerk because there is a couple of AP questions where they give you the sideways force. They don't ask it like this though. The rest of their problem isn't so funky, or screwy. What's that? Hello. Good homework. I have a question. Go ahead, Abby, bring it on. Um, I had a question that came up on number 11. It was like asking us to calculate the power like during an acceleration. And I figured it out by, um, you know, multiplying velocity times force. Okay. But um, I would try and, the thing I was trying to do before that was divide the change in kinetic energy by the time it took to accelerate. And that didn't work for some reason, and I don't know why. All right. Um, I'm just reading the question. It says, six dogs pull a two-person sled with a total mass of 280 kilograms. A coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.8, no, 0 0.08, and the sled accelerates at 0.75 meters per second squared until it reaches a cruising speed of 15 kilometers an hour. And what is the team's maximum power output during the acceleration phase. So as we define power, you know, it is, you know, it's work over time, but it's also force times velocity. But it's something to think about here. Um, the force is, is a constant because they tell us the acceleration is a constant but the velocity is not a constant, right? The velocity is gonna reach some maximum. So in looking at which one of these you'd probably use, you know, I think the way you'd have to do it is to figure out if you want the maximum power output, you probably have to come up with what the uh, maximum velocity is and what the size of the force is acting on the, the, the team. Because they do say maximum power output during the acceleration phase. So I think you're gonna be needing to get more power towards the end when the velocity is higher. So we need to find the velocity when we, well, actually, no, we have the velocity, 15 kilometers an hour. So the sled accelerates at 0.75 meters per second squared. Is this as simple as 
MA times 15. Is it as simple as that? I mean, that's basically what I did. I was just wondering why the- um, I know why. Neck energy over time wouldn't work. Well, or first, this, this is probably wrong. How have you did it this way? where you found out what the force is by the acceleration of the mass of the sled dogs. I think this won't give you the right answer because the sled dogs have to work harder than this, right? They're overcoming friction. Yeah. I so don't you have to, they want the, they want the force from the sled dogs, not the net force. Cause that's the power output of the dogs. Yeah. So the force of the sled dogs minus friction equals MA, where this is the acceleration of the system. So we need to figure out the frictional force first, which is going to be mu times MG. So I think what we actually have is MA plus mu MG times 15 converted to meters per second. That should give you the right answer. Now, if you're asking why the change in kinetic energy won't do it for us, it's because of the same thing we just, the same reason to this. Um, this gives us the maximum power out. It's a power is changing as the sled picks up speed. But moreover, you would be finding the average net power from the dogs. It would not include the energy lost by friction. It would only include the result of the two forces acting on the, the system, the sled dogs and the frictional force. So I think to answer this question correctly, um, you couldn't use change in kinetic energy alone. If you subtracted the work done by friction? Still then... not, it's, it's an average. Because at time equals zero, when the velocity of the, of the sled is zero, there's no power. The power is increasing the whole time. Because what we really have is a constant force, but a changing velocity. So the sled dogs have to apply more power to the sled to maintain the same acceleration the whole time. Yeah, okay, that answers it, thanks. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm and, and don't you know, this is kind of a weird question. I, I've never given it before, but you know, trying to think about it, you guys who have all run, if you're running fast and you're asked to run faster, you will have to become, you have to output more power. So the faster you run, and if you want to maintain an acceleration, you're going to be having to work harder. That's going to be more power. That's what the dogs are doing. So the dogs apply less power at the beginning when they're going slow than at the end when they're already going fast. If they're trying to maintain a constant force on the system. Is there more to this question? I didn't even scroll. Well, if it's a constant velocity at this point, the net force equals zero, right? Okay, yeah. So if you want to do part B of this question, the only force you're applying then is you're applying a force equivalent to the frictional force. Is that right? So you just have mu mg times the 15. Is that it? So this is for question B. This is for A. Okay. That's number 11. Um, power is a footnote on our problems. It is never the primary part of a problem. So in any one of our questions, if there's going to be a question about power, it is very often one of three things. How long did something take? So you know how much work was done, and then you use power equals work over time to figure out how long something takes. Or it's like this, calculate the power that was used to make that happen. But it is never the primary part of a problem. It's going to be a part E or number two of part C or something like that. It's gonna be, it's gonna be tiny. Next question. Number nine. Number nine. This is Xander again? This is Xander again. Okay. All right, Xander, number nine. A 64 kilogram student is standing atop a spring in an elevator that is accelerating upwards at 3.1 meters second squared. The spring constant is 2,700 newtons per meter. By how much is the spring compressed? 
Um, okay. Uh, this kind of question, yeah, this is, this is an AP style question, asking questions about the, the compression of a spring under some kind of unusual circumstance. They will ask these kinds of questions all the time. And our, this is going to mix net force and um, work problems kind of together. So what we have here is a, a guy standing inside an elevator. So something like so, and he's on a spring in the elevator because that's, I guess, what you do. And he's just standing here. The, spring, the elevator is accelerating upwards at a, you guys, whatever number you got for acceleration, that's probably yours. And we want to know by how much the spring was compressed. So let's consider the forces acting on the person. That's where we have to start. The net force on the person is going to be equal to MA. There are two forces acting on the person. There is the spring force upwards and the weight of the person downwards. And that has to equal MA. The spring force on the person has got to be greater than the weight downwards so that the system accelerates upwards. So this is going to be Kx minus Mg equals Ma. Now that probably tells you what you have to do next, right? You have spring constant, you have mass, you have G, you have A. You're asked to figure out what X is. So I think you can, I think you can do that okay. Yeah, it was just getting to that point because um, I was I was so hung up on finding the distance. Like my brain was just so focused on that. I couldn't move to like trying to do anything else. All right. Sorry. These kind of things though, where you look at the maximum compression of the spring or the sp compression of the spring in a problem. I mean, there's no follow-up on this question, but there should be. There should be things like how much energy is in the spring that should be a question. There should be something here about, you know, the, the energy of the system or the rate that the potential energy is changing. There's quite a few questions that could be asked regarding this system inside of this. Um, AP tends to present questions with springs a little different than this, but this isn't out of the question. So spring questions, and I, I'm going to be very blunt here. A spring applies a normal force, but the size of that normal force is fluctuating based on the compression of the spring. So you're almost always going to have this in the problem in place of where you had a normal force before. So when you deal with the force part of the problem, you know, just consider the spring to be a normal force. And then where that force would be is going to be Kx or a tension force if the spring is pulling on you. Because it either pulls on you or it pushes on you. But all you're going to do is act like it's a tension or act like it's a normal force. But then before you finish the problem, replace tension to normal force with Kx because that's going to tell you what you're looking for when it comes to the springs, compression or extension. How do you know if it's going to be like negative KX? Because that's what we have right now. Negative is about direction. So the spring was compressed downwards, so that means the force from the spring was upwards. Okay. So it's just been pulled. Once I've drawn, once your free body diagram is there, you can ignore the KX. Okay. Once you know the direction of the force from the spring, you can ignore the negative part of Hooke's law. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But trust me, don't be confused. What if they hung the guy from the ceiling on the spring? Well, hung the guy. Um, that, that sounds wrong. What if the guy was hanging from the spring? That's not much better. But you get the idea how the problem is a little different than the spring is applying tension upwards. It would still be stretching downwards. But would it change where I'd put a negative sign? No. I know the spring is applying the upward force. And I'm making upwards positive in my problem. Okay. Anything else on the homework? Because this is it, and we're we're good to go. Um, number twelve. Okay. Yeah, twelve. Number twelve. Gardner pushes eleven kilogram lawnmower whose handle is thirty seven degrees above the horizontal. The lawnmower coefficient of rolling friction is 0.21, how much power does the gardener have to supply to push the lawnmower at a constant speed? All right, so, uh, let's see. 
Who's responsible for mowing their lawn at home? Me too. Do you like mowing the lawn? No, terrible. Okay. <laughs> I look at it as an hour of peace and quiet. <laughs> you, you might reach a, a point in your life when you're old like me where like, oh, I get a chance to get away from all of these people. Okay, <laughs> done. <laughs> I'm gonna go outside and be away from all of you for an hour. That, that's gonna be, that, that's, my, that's my lawn mowing experience. My neighbor bought a riding lawn mower and every time he sees me out there mowing my lawn, he asks, you wanna just borrow my riding lawn mower? No, but you can get it done in like 10 minutes. I know, no, nah, I'm okay. <laughs> all right, so uh, I'd say these are all the forces acting in the system. This is a force problem, you know, by and large, because we need to figure out the normal force to get the frictional force. So we don't know how hard he pushes on the lawnmower, but we need his force on the lawnmower to figure out how much work he's doing. So the gardener pushes 11 kilogram lawnmower whose handle is tilted 37 degrees above the horizontal. Because friction's involved with this problem and for the system to go at a constant velocity, we need to figure out this force in order to do the problem which means it's a net force equals zero problem first. Then you can go and calculate the power that he applies when you find out what this force is. So you gotta balance all these forces and basically deal with the normal force. All right, guys, I think that's, that's not for us. We can keep going, right? So do you want me to uh, finish this problem or is that enough information for you? I'm indifferent. Yeah. So we have the mass of the lawnmower. So I can go a little bit further here and say that the net force in the X direction is gonna be, uh, let's see, F cosine 37 degrees minus friction. And that's gonna be equal to zero. And the net force in the Y direction is gonna be normal minus. They forgot to tell the guys at, at school to go back into their classrooms because that's the first time the bell's rung, right? So it's pandemonium out there. Go ahead, enjoy. Right, that is the first bell we've heard, right? And then all of a sudden it was the release. So enjoy out there. Pandemonium. That's what we got, pandemonium. All right, guys at home. Um, what you're gonna have to do here is you're gonna have to do the typical friction equals mu times normal force substitutions. And do that and solve for this F. Once you have that, power equals that F times the velocity. Does that make sense? So we're gonna solve this side for normal force and say normal, hold on. Normal is going to equal mg, yeah, plus f sine 37. So I take that, put it here, and then this, put it there, and get f cosine 37 minus mu mg minus mu f sine 37 equals zero. And you have to solve that for f. And then once you get that, you have to multiply that times the velocity. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Does it? So is that, our, is that enough to get you going? Yeah, yeah. Just right. move it over four out and out. Yep. Okay, yep. Yep. Thank you. Mr. Shelton. You're welcome. Shelton. Yeah. What time is tutoring after school today? Seven at home, seven at night. Oh. If I show up. All right. We'll see if I show up. If it's going to be you, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that is true. No, just joking. I, if I'll probably, I'll probably, I'll probably turn up. It really depends on how the day goes today. Understood. So, but I'm also going to record the sessions in sixth and seventh period. So they will likely ask different questions and I'll post all of it. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, guys. It's kind of a mess here because the bells are all off the place, but uh, hope you guys have a nice day. Have a good day, Mr. Shelton. Um, wait, when are we having a test on this? 
What's that? Are we gonna test on this? Soon? Friday for sure. There's a test Friday. Yep. No, oh, two tests Friday. I know. Test in every class. I'm just gonna sit back and watch all of you suffer all day long. It's gonna be wonderful. Okay. Have a nice day. You too. Bye, guys.